The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. When I'm reading the Acts of the Apostles and when I'm reading about the prophets, I've noticed something, something very consistent with them, something missing in this day. And it is part of training and it is part of maturity, spiritual growth in the Word for people to have a focus. Now I'm going to ask you something. What are you alive for? That's a very important question. I ask because in your hearts, can you give an instant response? And is your response... See, most Christians... By the way, I'm not looking at the chat, but most Christians would say, I am alive, I live for Christ. Right? That's fine. But that's not a very focused and concise answer. What is your purpose for living? I'm asking this and asking you to define that for yourselves in truth. Because if you don't, if you simply say you're alive for Christ, it does mean something. It means you're mindful of Christ, but it also means you're prone to adopt the causes of others. You don't want to do that. For example, I am alive and I live for servitude. Servitude in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let all flesh be saved. That's what I live for. To assist the Lord in the work he already has so that all souls be saved. Does that mean that every soul is going to be saved? No. But it means if the Father had faith in us enough not to get rid of us, but to send his Son, that he would spend time to give us detailed instructions more than once, that he would send the prophets first. And because they were killed and people didn't listen to them, he sent his only begotten Son. And even he was killed, but became that sacrifice. And then he sent the apostles, and they were killed. Then guess what? We are here likewise. I'm here likewise to do my part so that folks can receive the gospel from Jesus because he is the only salvation in this world. There's no other assistance I can give anybody except that which is in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I live for the hope of Christ. The hope he has for all of humanity. The heart the Father has towards all of his creation. Which is, he desires that no one perish outside of him. The purpose of my life is servitude. Servitude in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So my purpose is defined. My entire life is for others. Even for those who are against me. And because I do have a defined purpose, I don't adopt the purpose of others. I won't shift, and I don't shift. I don't take up the causes of others. But in its simplest form, I join in with servitude of those who would lift up their brother. But the question is, why are you alive and what do you live for? What is your goal in life? These things have to be defined. Remember, anything you don't define for yourselves, Satan will surely seek to define. Because you have a lot of people who serve the Lord, but they think it's their life's purpose to destroy Satan. That's a very foolish cause. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? That sounds strange, doesn't it? To destroy Satan, right? Would be somebody's cause. You would think that would be an appropriate calling, an appropriate purpose of your life, correct? But it's not. You won't succeed. God will destroy Satan when he's ready for that. Ours is for the sake of our fellow man. But a lot of Christians, they're going around trying to destroy Satan. They try to stop prophecy or the beast. They don't like the idea of the beast or anything else. They're not accepting of the totality of God's word. Why though? Because their purpose, they want to be higher than what it really is. You can destroy the work of Satan in somebody's life, but you're not going to destroy Satan. Because if you seek out to destroy Satan, you're going to find Satan in everybody. You'll become a murderer. But the Lord called us to do what? To lift up our brother. To lay down our lives for the sake of our friends. To carry the gospel by the way we live, how we speak. To lift up those around us. To train up children in the way they should go. And in this way, your life is purposed to do what? To assist in servitude in accordance with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you serve as an example, you inspire others. And you inspire their faith. In so doing, you teach them that Christ is the answer. We must be careful never to teach anyone that we are the answer. But Christ is the answer. For those who have purposed their lives to destroy darkness, 
Look at your life and what has happened. You've just, some people set themselves out to destroy something, but the Father says he will not destroy until it's all said and done. Imagine a football game. Now we all know that people play football and they compete with one another. And whoever scores the most touchdowns, are, they are the ones victorious. So imagine a person that says, no, I'm going to win by injuring the entire opposing team before they ever get started. And then suppose that person really believed that's what he or she should do. Of course, we all know that's not the way that game is played. That somebody's going to be defeated, but they're going to be defeated within a rule set. Unless you find yourself cheating. Well, with the Lord, he did not destroy Satan, but Satan fell. He did not destroy the fallen angels, but the fallen angels in fact fell. There are demons running around all over the place. There are evil spirits on the earth also. He did not destroy them. But what did he do? With all that existing in the earth, can't touch the individual that truly seeks the Father through and through. They can't do it. In other words, darkness exists and it can exist. But if a person abide in the light, they are separated from the darkness and the darkness can no longer invade their lives. So what did Jesus teach us to do? He taught us to be a demonstration of the way to him because we learn by example, don't we? And he taught us to be those examples in the earth, the purpose of your life. If you don't have a purpose or you have not considered it, let me tell you what you've been doing. You follow people and you've taken up the cause of other folks, plenty of them, haven't you? If you look in your life carefully, because most of us did not begin with a purpose, you began to look at someone and you tried to emulate someone. And in so doing, what did you do? You took up the cause of somebody else. Look at your own life. See it for yourselves of how many people you adopted their cause not the cause of the Lord but somebody else's cause because you let them define only what the Lord can define and you found yourself following the cause of other folks and when they disappointed you you got away from them and found somebody else to follow and for the most part many people have been doing this for a long time simply because they did not have an answer to that question why are they alive what do they live for even in your homes have you guys ever noticed that when you're trying to accomplish something in your homes and everything gets in your way, what happens to you? You get an attitude, don't you? You get angry, upset. Sometimes people are disheartened because they cannot meet the goal of that day. Suppose you set out to really to paint your house or something. And you've been thinking about that all week. So that's your purpose, that's your goal. So suppose as soon as you open the paint, you start getting phone calls. Somebody down the street has an emergency. They request you. They haven't done this all week. But as soon as you start to work toward your goal, here come the interruptions. And when they come because they get in the way, you become angry at the interruptions. You become irritated because everything is taking you away from your goal. Then ultimately, you don't complete the goal. And what happens? You're in a bad mood. You're not very joyful, are you? You're irritated. You feel like life has betrayed you somehow or life is not worth it. But to get you to see something, every time something gets in the way of a goal that you have made for yourself, whatever you purpose yourself for, if something gets in the way, that something becomes the enemy. It becomes your enemy. So you find yourself angry at elements that would interrupt you. Everybody knows what that is, right? Everybody should know what it is to have a goal and you're joyful about that goal, but then things come and get in the way of that goal, which changes your attitude, causes you to go against anything that interrupts you from that, and your whole day goes down the tubes. Then you wake up the next day, the same issue is facing you, and you begin to develop an attitude of what's the use? If I begin to do it, everything's just going to get in the way, so I'm gonna go and pick something else. So what you end up doing is abandoning your goal. If you do this too much with too many goals, it reinforces a deep negativity in your life until you reach the point where you, you start speaking very negatively as though you can't accomplish anything. And you have an attitude or a mindset where you say, what's the use of putting my everything towards this? Something will come and just kill it. What's the use of doing this and what's the use of doing that? You may not know this, but even in the word of God among Christians, the same thing has happened. Can anybody tell me what has power to give you a bad attitude? Anybody? If you've ever woke up in a bad mood, let me ask you this. What had power over your life to change the light of God into the darkness? 
That's what a bad attitude is. A bad attitude is a bad outlook. What power is being exercised over your life that that would happen? I tell you, it comes by way of having no purpose. Because when you think something is going to get in your way and stop your purpose, and you don't endeavor to do it, you've already given up. You do this too many times, and you begin to fight the wrong fight. Do you guys know Jesus taught about this? Which is why he had, by the Holy Spirit, he talked to us about trials and tribulations. He defined just about everything. So you could understand something. So I give you something, right? Because most of you have experienced this negativity I'm speaking of. Some of you right now are sitting in that negativity. Don't you want to get rid of that? If any of you out there could address the issue of why are you alive? What do you live for? And if you would take up a purpose within the word of God that is achievable first, whatever he gave you, and go and do that thing when something tries to interrupt it, have patience with it. How do you have patience with something that's going to interrupt you? Because the goal of what you're doing for the Lord is not your victory. It's a victory for the one you're doing it for, not you. And what I'm exposing here is that many of us, when we set a goal, it's for us. We think if we meet the conditions of that goal, we're going we're gonna to be on top of the world. It does make you feel better when you do that. The problem is, if you keep doing things for yourself like that, you develop a habit of doing everything for yourself. And your joy is going to be contingent upon your completion of things and not the completion of somebody else's things. So if you switch that around by doing this, right? This is, this is a redirection from what the world does into what Jesus taught. All the teachings of Christ, they tell us that our joy is in what he called us to do. The completion of that, for example, the Lord called all of us. We, we have a common ground in our calling, which is the gospel. So he called all of us to be an example of that as best we can. Starting with that goal, if you are being a Christian and say one day you fall flat on your face and somebody sees it and that somebody tends to go astray because you fell, you could be devastated, correct? That's the precise thing you don't focus on. So let me give you something else. When you're in representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you're doing the best you can, don't set your mind on completing something so you can have joy. Complete the task so somebody else can be free. The goal of your calling is for somebody else. You see, by freeing others, you are free. You know that? Did you guys catch that? Your goal should be the freedom of another. Not yourselves, but the freedom of another. So here's another question. Would you forego captivity so somebody else can be free? Yes or no? Would you tolerate, put up with, live in bondage so somebody else won't have bondage? Yes or no? Many people would automatically answer, well, it's not supposed to be that way. But here's the truth. Once we're willing to live in bondage so somebody else will not have bondage, if you're really willing to do that, then in all truth, you have no complaints, nor can you have a bad attitude, nor will you have short, you, you won't have this shortness with other folks, because you have made the purpose of your life your neighbor. You know in the Bible when the Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself, and he defined that love, when he said, give hoping for nothing in return, he said, what good is it to love those who love you, even the publicans do that? But he was teaching us, do for others, that they couldn't possibly do back for you. In other words, forego that captivity and bondage for the sake of somebody else. Lay your life down for the sake of somebody else. See, our goals that we make in life, they're for us. I've never seen so many frowns than when you look at Christians Monday through Friday. Sunday, of course, they smile. Monday through Friday, they do not. They are troubled on every side. Distressed, perplexed, disheartened, can't wait till Jesus comes ready to get out of this world but when you're ready to depart this world you're also ready to give up on everybody else who's falling you've thrown in the towel and you said i quit in truth i'm ready to go right now but i'm not willing to give up on anybody out there does that make sense so that's a conflict with me yes i'm going to love to be with the lord but that also means i would have to let go of laying things down for the sake of somebody else when your heart is tied on to somebody else making it all of a sudden, all things become worth it. Do you know that? All of a sudden, you're no longer tired. You know what makes us tired? When we begin to see things in repetition, when we don't get what we want, that's when we're tired. 
when we feel we're not making a change in things, that's when we're tired. When we feel we can accomplish this, that, and the other, or no one's going to listen to us, that's when we're tired. So imagine this. Imagine if one laid their lives down for their friend, they really did this. And imagine knowing the ways of the Lord that you may never see your friend fully convert, but you know in your heart that you're doing everything in your power to offer them something. See, you never listen, never throw something at somebody. Never throw the word at somebody. Never demand the word of somebody, but always give the word to somebody. Always give it. Whatever you do, give it. Never demand anything back. Utilize the principles of Christ in your life, and I'm telling you, your whole life will change. But give everything, expecting nothing in return. That goes with your conversations. That goes with your love. That goes with everything. Give, expecting nothing in return. When you live your life like this, you're constantly serving into somebody else. And when you constantly sow into somebody else, knowing why you're doing it, and by the way, you're doing it, so they have the victory. Well, then your life is defined. Remember something. God called us so somebody else can have the victory. Do you know that? God called you in a very specific way so that someone else can have the victory. You're called to assist in the victory of somebody else. The question is, can you now go forward knowing this? See, most people want that victory for themselves because that's what you hear. They'll say, I don't care what happens, my Lord's going to save me. Everything's back to me, 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 me. You don't hear anybody talking about their neighbor anymore, do you? Even the sermons that are preached, people tell you, you're going to be okay. You're going to do this. But see, that's not how Jesus preached. Jesus constantly told us, sow your life into your, your neighbor, into your friend. You know who your neighbor is? Your neighbor is somebody to your left and to your right, in front of you and behind you. Your neighbor is everybody but you. It does not matter. If they stand against you or for you, they are your neighbor. That's who you're here for. That's what you're alive for. That's what you were made for. That is the work of the Lord. The Lord is the Lord of salvation. His work is salvation. And if we take up a cross and follow him, then our work becomes salvation. So then in truth, we're here for the sake of somebody else's victory. When you begin to go through life like that, you're going to find your problems are gone. But you're also going to find something else. See, some of you actually require deliverance. And it seems like you can't be delivered and you don't know why. You hear the messages. You've tried the prayers and everything else. You know what I know. It's not been taken away from you. Some of you still struggle with certain things in your life. Hear me on this. Have you noticed a pattern in your life of when God moves in your life, in your circumstances and situations? Just in case you haven't, let me refresh your memory so you can look back on your life and see it for yourself. Every time you determined within your heart to sow into somebody else's victory, that's when you were delivered. Every time you settled the matter in your heart, then you were going to go the extra mile for somebody else who does not care about you. That's when confusion left your mind. Every single time. But have you noticed that when you attempted to obtain things from the Lord, you fell short? When you attempted to get a victory for yourself, you became sicker. Have you noticed that pattern? Every time you tried something for yourself, it fooled you. But every time you gave it all for somebody else, the Lord then returned something unto you. You may not know this, but your victory is tied to your calling. You're called for the sake of somebody else. By laying down your life for the sake of somebody else, you assure the victory in your own life. Although you should never think of that, because your servitude should be authentic. Which means, in truth, the motivation for doing what you do should not be to save your own skins. The word is clear. Those who seek to save their lives are going to lose it. Now, I don't know why people don't preach this, but you've got to stop thinking about saving your own life. It's the same reason Jesus said, do your good deeds in secret that your Father may reward you openly. Let me tell you why. When you lay down your life and everything that you are for the sake of somebody else's victory, you're in full compliance with the Word of God when you do that. You are of the right heart, and guess what? The windows of heaven can open up to you. The windows of heaven cannot open up to the disobedient. If you seek to save your own life, that's when you murder somebody else. That's when you have no patience with other people. That's when you really believe in your heart that other folks won't make it. Some of you who have talked to me personally, you know for a fact because I've frustrated you with this one thing. There are people that everybody counted out that do terrible things. And they're Christians, but I refuse to give up on them. I've heard comments back from people close to me who said, Why do you even try? They're not going to change. 
That's exactly who the Lord came for. Why would you go to that? That one can't even walk on their own. They got the word twisted backwards. That's exactly who the Lord came for. He had to die for us so that we could be saved. A conversation would not do it. Instruction would not do it. He had to die for us. Think about that. If he had to die for us, then surely I'll end up giving up everything in my life for the sake of somebody else. But see, I'm okay with that. The question is, are you? Would you really make a sacrifice for somebody else who does not care about you? Because I'll tell you this, the Lord sure did it for us. When Jesus said, Father, if you could remove this cup from me, nevertheless, I will be done. When Jesus was frightened, when he was scared to the point of sweating blood, when his body could no longer take the fear of what he had to do, he said, nevertheless, I will be done. You know what that means? That means what he walked into was dreadful. It was scary. It was horrific. And he knew what he had to do. He knew what it was going to feel like. And that didn't stop him. Why didn't it stop him? Because his love for us became his striving for us. And to the point of death, he fulfilled his purpose for the sake of us. He is the one who set the standards for us. That means for somebody else, if his spirit be within me, then in truth, I would do the same for the sake of somebody else. That means I really can't lose anything because I was born into this world to lay down everything for the sake of somebody else. When Jesus died, you had to remember the ones he died for also crucified him. Somebody's crucifying you. And you're asking God to take that person away. And I don't mean in a relationship physically beating you. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I said somebody is crucifying you. Somebody has something negative to say about you every time you see them. And you're asking the Lord to remove that person so you can save yourself. That's not why you're here. And that's why that person has not been removed. See, ironically, I'm finding out more and more. Most of the folks we want gone from our lives are the very ones God sent us here to be examples toward. Ironic, isn't it? That's somewhat the opposite of what most people ask the Lord for, isn't it? When you do this, that's when your situation changes. That's when you begin to stand up in your calling. You know what the Lord said? He'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Well, see, that word glory is connected to something. That word glory is connected to the Lord shining brilliantly. And if he does so, somebody has to see him shining brilliantly in order for that to be glory. You see, glory that nobody can see is not glory at all. Glory is only glory when others behold it. According to his riches and his glory of how others see him through you, you're part of God's glory. But if you're saving yourself, how then can you glorify God? You can't. See, after somebody casts you down to the ground, after you have perished, let's say, perished, maintaining the standards of the living God, not returning evil for evil, but returning good for the evil that comes to you. See, it's after you're gone, people think, well, that person never wants if they really do this, that, or the other. Look at the leaders of this world without Christ, right? Just, let's take, let's just look at the world. In the world, we all know that a good story comes when a person perishes in that story after doing lots of good things, but they were hated by so many, and then everybody finds out the good they sowed into the world. And all of a sudden, because that person sowed good into the world, but at the time they thought they were rotten and they perished, after that person is gone and dead, that's when the other folks change. They don't change when the person is alive. They change when the person is gone. You know what that's called? A legacy, a real legacy. That's an imprint, a shadow that everybody leaves in this world. Somebody is going to be corrupted or somebody's going to find the Lord based upon your life. When your life is purposed, you're not afraid of the pain because you have understanding behind your life now. The worst thing you could ever do is have no understanding behind your life. Many of you, when you first came here, you were upset by the past because you had no idea what the Lord had done. A lot of abused people, they didn't know why a person did what they did to them. And in fact, your life was somewhat ruined by what happened in the past until you found out that you were at the front lines, that no one came to your rescue. 
so that you could understand the language of those who heard from that situation now, so that you could recognize the spirits that are in this world that will seek to do it to somebody else, and now you can do something called intervention, and now you speak the language of those who have been abused, and now they can be reached, because when you prayed, no one came. Now they're praying, and you can hear their prayers. You can see the signs in their face. No one can do that to you, because it takes a person who must go through that. They must understand your predicament. And the only way we can understand somebody else's predicament is to go through it. Now some of you have gone through it. You've gone through that. So now you can understand somebody else. You are the answer to your own prayer. When you prayed for somebody to get you out of that situation, you didn't know how. And nobody came for you. So then you could learn of that situation. It hurt you to pieces and messed you up. That's good. You know why? Because now you are sensitive to that same pain in somebody else. And you have become the answer to somebody else's life. That goes with drinking. That goes with drugs. That goes with every situation you can imagine. You have become a force against the darkness. And many of you didn't even know that. Why? Because you had no understanding about your life. And you blamed your past for all these things, not knowing what the Lord had actually done. You didn't know what it yielded. That was part of your training. But you just can't tell somebody that because they wouldn't understand what's being said. You have to go through something to be qualified. When he called, he also qualified. That was your qualification. You have become the answer to your own prayer. And you didn't even know it. Because you are that little girl, that little boy that you see in the world right now. That's who you are. Oh yes, and Satan decides, he, listen, he wants you to never think by way of that perspective. He wants you to blame everybody so that you can remain in the valley of disobedience, so that you cannot help those that he has targeted in the world. If he can tie you up with your own circumstances, you'll never hear anybody else. If he can turn you inwardly to all of your own problems, you'll never hear that little child screaming, somebody help me. You'll be too tied up. That's what he wants to do. So by the reading of the word in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you hear many words of Jesus arming you with this one thing. He already told you you're going to go through things. So you should never be tied up inwardly by what you go through. You've been equipped, and now Satan cannot stop you. If you were to hear a young one, see, you have the passion to approach the person. You're going to be far more sensitive to that little voice, to that movement in the person. When you see a kid walking with their parents and they turn around and look, you're going to understand that look. You'll understand the look of their parents. You'll see what nobody else can see, and Satan knows that. Don't let him tie you up in your circumstances of today. Don't let him do that. Understand that your calling is first and foremost. You are the answer to a prayer. You are the prepared one. You can pierce the darkness now. But I'll say it again, if you're tied up blaming your past, you're tied up in your own problems right now. You'll never hear the cry of the others. You won't fulfill your calling. You'll be too busy trying to save yourself. Understand the, why you're here. Why you're here is tied to your past. Understand it. Don't be ashamed of it. The very thing you're ashamed of, the very thing you try to hide, is the very thing God will use to pierce the darkness for somebody else. Do you know that? It's that old famous saying, the thing that you're trying to hide is the thing that God wants to use. You don't have to be ashamed of it part of your qualification when we call the also qualified. Satan knows exactly what the Lord is putting you and he's frightened of you. You know the Bible says if you resist the devil he will flee from you. You know flee means to run away like your life depends on it. How do you resist the devil? By staying yourself on the word of God. When he says you can't do it you remind yourself the Lord said you will do it. When he says something won't work you remind yourself what the Lord said all things are possible to them that believe. In other words, don't listen to the thoughts that invade your mind. Remember the scriptures from those who recorded the sayings of the Lord. Remember what the Lord said and speak those things in your heart. Don't agree with the enemy by way of the thoughts he will implant in your mind. See, sometimes we're prideful thinking that the thoughts we have belong to us. If they're good, we're going to keep them. But the more you examine your thoughts, the more you're going to understand that most of the thoughts that you have are invasions. They try to invade your mind. And if you think about those thoughts long enough, they can trickle down and enter into your heart. Your mind is like a gateway to the heart. But you will determine what enters your heart or not. You determine that. 
The more you think about a situation that was wrong, the more you're going to become angry by it. And if you stay thinking, if you stay your mind on thinking about that situation, it's going to enter into your heart. Then you're going to stand up on your feet and start doing something about that situation you probably should not do. But if you take captive that thought and kick it out and you start utilizing forgiveness, remember that your Lord forgave you. That instead of a curse, he gave you a blessing. His name is Yahshua HaMashiach. If you do the same and apply those principles to your life, there'll be no darkness in you. When Satan speaks, you know what he says? Let it die. That's what Satan says. It's dying. It's going to die anyway, so just let it die. You know what the Lord says? Speak to those dry bones, those things that were dead. Prophesy. In other words, to prophesy is to speak what the Lord spoke over something. That's prophesying. Do you know that? Prophesying is not speaking anything new, but to speak what the Lord said. My goodness, Satan never wants you to know who you really are. Because if you did know, love would ooze out of you like an endless waterfall. He would have lost the battle of you and everybody around you. But be warned, if he can turn you inwardly, he'll tie up your whole life on useless things.